We are teetering on a knife's edge. We are in a dangerous spot in history. It's this, this deja vu of 2005, six, and seven all over again. People justifying why the real estate that they are invested in is going to be exempt from the coming crash. <laughs> and it is exactly the same, this denial that to me is just spooky and suggesting that we're going to go through this uh, crash and painful period, but I wanna show you how big this is and how it relates to the other legs of the economy. Happy Turkey Day. I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And I am here in Utah right now. I'm going to be spending Thanksgiving with some of my family. And, but of course, I want to talk about the economy. I'm not here to talk about Thanksgiving right now. Now, the economy is sort of like a three-legged stool. Uh, there are three pillars, three legs that hold up the economy. And, you know, we look a lot at the stock markets, uh, but that is just one of the legs. When you think of the economy, I'm looking out a window here. When you think of the economy, you think of businesses and, you know, gas stations, grocery stores, all the cars are going around. That's the economy, banks and so on. And um, uh, so those are all businesses. And so in the financial markets, we use the publicly listed companies, the stock market, as our proxy for the economy. But there are two other legs that are extremely important. Uh, one is the real estate sector. Real estate is a huge portion of the economy. And then the third leg is the debt markets, the bonds and notes and bills and so on. Uh, and the debt markets are also the backbone of the banking system. It's their monetary system that they use between one another. It's their assets that they, you know, they hold mortgages and they hold bonds and bills and notes, treasure, U.S. treasuries usually. And so those are the three main legs that hold up the economy. So you've got, you know, the weight on top, the seat, is the economy. And it's the, uh, the, there's also the weight that sits on it of government spending and, and all of the other things that we do. So let's take a look at some of these legs and see what the health is. Now, in the last video that was released with Alan Hibbard and, and myself, uh, we analyzed real estate home price index. This is Robert Schiller's data of Yale University. And we took the, the chart that was in the book and we updated it and extended it and we found it had gone from about 110% uh, overvalued to about 125% overvalued. Now this data goes all the way back to 1880 and <clears throat> what Dr. Robert Schiller has done is inflation adjusted it. So you're seeing the value, not the price. It's the home price, real home price index and adjusted for inflation, which is real pricing, uh, they are, real estate is currently about 125% overvalued, and this is the 20 city index. So um, it's, it's pretty much representative of what is going on in the United States. And what you see here is the greatest real estate bubble in history. And so uh, we're gonna take a look at another way that this, uh, you know, another set of proof, another way of measuring it that shows the same thing. But I do wanna say, that I have been presenting this since 2004, right about where that arrow is. Um, my first video, and you can find it uh, on this channel, uh, is the Silver Summit in 2004, and I present this chart, uh, but it was only up to where that arrow is. And I tell people that this is uh, the greatest real estate bubble of all time, and it's going to have disastrous con consequences, and all bubbles burst. And so I was warning people back then. And then <clears throat> a year later, I joined Robert Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the largest selling financial book in history, uh, speaking to audiences of real estate investors all over. We traveled the world from uh, 2005 to 2010. In 2006 and seven, uh, there were the Learning Annex Real Estate Investment Expos. And Robert had a uh, PBS, a public broadcasting system special that would air, and then they would have this uh, convention in each of these major cities. I missed the San Francisco show, 
but there were 30,000 attendees at the Los Angeles Convention Center, and then 15,000 each at Atlanta and New York, and 10,000 each in Chicago and Boston. And so in just one year, I spoke to 80,000 people live, which is more than anybody in my sector has spoken to in their lifetimes. Uh, and uh, that I was warning people, I was showing this chart, I was showing the Dow gold ratio, I was showing the gold real estate ratio, and I was <clears throat> showing investors that real estate was hugely uh, overvalued. In fact, Robert used to open up the show with like in Los Angeles, he goes, <clears throat> real estate's gonna crash and all you flippers in the audience are gonna get slaughtered. So <laughs> here's all these people that come to see the real estate guru of all real estate gurus and he's telling them real estate is going to crash. But he promoted cash flow investing, not speculation on homes. And so he was warning people and it did crash and people got slaughtered. Well, I would present this evidence and People would, uh, about one out of 10 or maybe two out of 10, would take this evidence in and maybe consider protecting themselves. But the other eight or nine out of 10 people would, would have some justification, some reason to dismiss this, even though they were highly leveraged on real estate. Uh, they would find a way to ignore it. Oh, but real estate only goes up. <laughs> that, I heard that one a lot. Oh, but you know, where I'm invested, there's a shortage of this type of housing that I'm investing in. Well, it doesn't matter if there's a supply demand issue or if there's a shortage. If you are uh, over leveraged and we go into a crisis, if something becomes unaffordable, it's just unaffordable to everybody. It's reached its bubble peak and it's going to crash. Uh, so <clears throat> over the next five years, you know, in 2006, 2007, 2008, I was warning people of this, and then the book, my first book came out one month before the Lehman Brothers, you know, the global financial crisis of 2008. And I had been warning people for a long time to get ready for this. The few that did listen, that took in the information that is just numbers, they took in the numbers, uh, they sort of weighed the evidence, and then they protected themselves. And, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Russ Gray, who you will see interviewed here uh, sometime soon, um, he said to me recently that, boy, if I had taken out equity and instead of buying more real estate, bought some gold, the reverse correlation of the gold going up while the real estate was crashing, and it went up big time, so your gold like uh, doubled during the time where real estate fell by half. Uh, if I had taken that equity out, he said, uh, I would have been protected through all of this. And so we're going to be interviewing Russ to get his real life experience of going through the agony of uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 and how it affected him. Now, you got to remember that uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 was all triggered by the real estate collapse and real estate derivatives, and it almost shut down the world financial system. So let's take a look at more proof that real estate is in the massive bubble. And, you know, Alan Hibbert and I went through these charts in the last video in some depth. So I'm duplicating a little bit of this here, but I've got a lot more that you need to see and how it all relates to this. Uh, this is the home price to median household income ratio. So this is how many years of your income you are paying for a home. If you were to save up everything, uh, you know, not eat, not clothe yourself, not live anywhere for uh, four years is what people were paying for four and a half years. And then during the peak of the 2007, six, seven, uh, eight bubble, uh, it got up to about 6.75 years, six and three quarters years. And now it's at seven and a third years. So it is, this is two ways of looking at it, and it's the biggest bubble in history. Now, um, this is where I started warning people. And I was, all, you know, since 2015, I think, I've also been using the, uh, the mortgage calculators to show the uh, affordability of a home, because this is just the, the price to median household income. 
if you take the mortgage payment to median household income, it is much more volatile than this. And uh, it's, it's just absolutely soared uh, in the past two years. We went from 3% 30-year mortgages to 7.5% 30-year mortgages. And Alan and, I, Alan and I showed in the last video that um, a million-dollar home uh, at 3% uh, gives you a $4,000 mortgage payment. And the, the same mortgage payment today only buys you a, uh, a, a $600,000 home. So the affordability has gone down by 40%. You get 40% less uh, house for the same mortgage payment. But what we didn't show is that if you still want that, um, that million dollar home, the mortgage payment has gone up by 66%. That is huge. Uh, and so the affordability, it doesn't matter um, if there is a shortage of real estate, if nobody can afford it. And what I'm experiencing is this deja vu, people justifying. You know, I stopped doing all uh, presentations and interviews in 2018 so that I could knuckle down and get my book done. And uh, like I said, I had uh, Alan and another researcher and an editor uh, uh, working on it with me that were on my payroll, basically, and uh, trying to get this thing done and make it uh, something that was very, very comprehensive and had all of the information in one place. And then recently I started doing, you know, the book is done. So now I started doing interviews and making public appearances. And I just appeared at a real estate conference, a bunch of real estate investors. And then I did a, uh, an interview on a real estate channel. And there's these justifications of, oh, but there's this shortage of real, you know, it's this, this deja vu of 2005, six and seven all over again. People justifying why the real estate that they are invested in is going to be exempt from the coming crash. <laughs> and it is exactly the same, this denial uh, that uh, uh, is to me is just spooky and suggesting that we're going to go through this uh, crash and painful period, but I wanna show you how big this is and how it relates to the other legs of the economy. This was real estate. And, and you know, you see that it's gone from four uh, years of income for paying uh, for a house to uh, seven and a third. So this is crazy. It's the biggest real estate bubble in history, like we said in the last video, but let's take a look at the stock markets real quick. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, GoldSilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making GoldSilver.com your dealer. And now, back to the video. And this is P.E. ratios, so it's the price of a stock divided by the earnings per share to sort of come up with a valuation on whether you're paying too much or too little for a stock. And what you see is that this goes back to 1880 and all the way in to the mid 90s, the mean was about 14. And they used to say that fair value was 12. Uh, you know, back in, in the early 2000s when we were in the, I, I would hear that uh, fair value was 12 and we were in a bubble. Uh, and the, at least the people that I was following, the people measuring the numbers. And um, what you see here is that we've just come off of the second largest stock market bubble in history. Uh, and it has about, this chart is from the book. It's bounced back up since then and Alan and I will be covering uh, these other legs of the economy in detail in separate videos. But I felt that it was sort of an emergency and you need all of the information in one place so that you can compare it and hold it all in your head at once. And so I'm making this video. But this has bounced back up to 30.8, uh, which puts it back up, you know, in it's almost as high as the 32 or 33 that I think it was at 32 in 1929 before the great stock market crash of 29 and the Great Depression. So we're up at 30.8, and uh, 
and you see that the mean is about 14, except the bubble century. We have been living in these um, crazy times where people are looking at these crazy valuations, and you can see that we had a hyper bubble going on in the year 2000, and in 2021, it was another hyper bubble. And so we're just in a super bubble right now, <laughs> yeah, up at 30.8. But there are other ways of looking at this, other ways of measuring it. So uh, where were we when the, when the real estate crisis triggered the stock market to collapse as well? Uh, you know, we were up at about um, 27, uh, 27, maybe 28. And so we were nowhere near where we're at today. And we, you know, the stock market is coming down uh, from what is that about 37 or 38 uh, PE ratios. It came down, it bounced back up to 30.8. Uh, and so we are at much higher bubble, bubble levels than when the crisis of 08 happened. The stock market is in a greater bubble and the higher the cliff, the bigger the fall. So the worse the crash uh, will end up being. But there's other ways of measuring this. This is the Buffett indicator. So you're taking all of the publicly listed stocks, all of the shares times the price per share gives you the valuation of all of the publicly listed companies. They have no business being larger than the economy. So what we're doing here is we're taking the GDP of the United States and dividing it by the uh, publicly listed companies and what you come out with is the value of the publicly listed companies, <clears throat> the mean was about 60% of the economy here in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then this century, it went insane. And uh, we had a bubble that was a super bubble in the year 2000. And then it was pushed back into a bubble by the Federal Reserve uh, and Alan Greenspan taking interest rates down to 1%. And uh, real estate went into a, bu a, a, a super bubble because of that. Uh, and then the crash of 2008 and Ben Bernanke's response has pushed, and then Yellen and then Powell, has pushed the stock market back up into a hyper bubble, the greatest bubble in history. We are deflating from that now. This uh, was as of when the book was published. So Alan and I will update this in an upcoming video. But we're coming off of the greatest stock market bubble in history, and it's been deflating. It hasn't crashed yet. Uh, if something else uh, triggers that, we will see a crash. And so I think 2024 could be a historic year. However, it's an election year. And they are going to try and kick this can down the road and push it off as long as possible. The longer that they put this off, the worse it will be. So that's where we were back into when, when real estate peaked and started to crash and it drug the stock market down with it. But there's other ways of measuring this. This is the number of uh, average work hours. So the uh, average wage, uh, you know, how many work hours do you have to accumulate to, so that the amount of currency that you've saved, the number of dollars is equal to the points on the S&P 500. And that gives you uh, the dollars that it would require if the points was one share of the S&P 500. So how many work hours does it take to buy one share of the S&P? And you can see this goes back to 1860. And for the first 130 years of this chart, it never exceeds 40 and it doesn't go under 10. Uh, and after you have been in a bubble, it usually visit, visits severely undervalued territory. It'll go down to, to 10. But it, you know, the average here is 22 hours of work is fair value to buy one share of the S&P. And we're up at 122. This is, uh, so we've, we've have a crazy valuation century right now where everybody is sort of used to these crazy evaluations. But right now, we are at insane levels. We're way beyond just crazy. <laughs> and so <clears throat> when this corrects, what it's suggesting is that to get back down to fair value, the stock markets would have to uh, crash by 82% to get back down to that 22. And to go to 10, it's a 92% crash that it would take. Or 
Uh, alternatively, what you could have is incomes could go up five and a half times, and then it would return to 22. It would return to that mean. If everybody's income went up five and a half times, it would be in balance with the stock market. But it's not. It's out of balance. It's totally insane. So let's move on. And, and you know, where, where were we uh, in when real estate triggered the stock market crash? That's where we were at about... 70 or 70, 75, uh, and now we're up at 122. So the crash that is going to, that when these crashes trigger each other, now <clears throat> in the year 2000, that was only a stock market crash. Uh, real estate was just taking off. It was not affected by the stock market crashing, crashing and bonds were not affected at all. They kept on in their perfect uh, bull market. And so, it was that was stocks only. Then in 2008, real estate was in a hyper bubble, and stocks were in a just a bubble or super bubble, and real estate drugged down stocks with it. So it was a real estate and stock market crash. But where are we with bonds? This is the uh, the the bond bull market that started in 1982. So you've got this uh, this. Uh, bull market that goes on for more than 40 years and it's just an absolutely picture perfect bull market so this is the 30-year uh, treasury so the longest bond and um, and it broke its uh, trend line here and so the bond bull market is officially over and uh, it the according to bloomberg the 30-year treasury is, has lost 53 percent so existing 30-year treasuries, before the interest rates started going up, have lost 53% of their value. And where were we back in 2008? We were down there. We were, at a, we were lower than where the bond market already is. But the bond market is something that is like the fuse for the stock market and the real estate uh, market, the collapse of these giant uh, super bubbles and hyper bubbles. And so the bond market was in a super bubble and that is popping. So we, all three legs of the economy, but this is like a picture of the debt markets. Now, when um, the U.S. gets into trouble and they want to do more spending, they want to do bailouts, they need currency, the Federal Reserve is handcuffed as to how they create currency. The Federal Reserve Act specifies that they can only create currency by typing currency into existence and buying uh, an asset that is fully backed and guaranteed as to the principal and interest by the U.S. government, or in other words, by you, the taxpayer. And so the Federal Reserve has to buy a U.S. Treasury, or now, with the, uh, you'll see uh, shortly, with the nationalization of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in 2008, that made them... Uh, a government-backed security, which they could also buy. Uh, and so, uh, but they have to buy that through their primary dealers, this uh, 18 to 32 uh, brokerage houses, and they're the world's largest brokerage houses. So they're buying them from the financial markets. And they buy these assets with brand new currency that flows into the financial markets. And then the, uh, the brokerage houses have to go out and replace those assets that they just sold, and they usually buy a higher yielding stock or uh, another bond. And then they turn around and sell those bonds again to the, treasure, to the Federal Reserve next month. Uh, and so uh, it's pumping currency into the financial markets, blowing the financial markets up into a bubble. Wherever the currency, new currency goes first, uh, creates a, it inflates that sector. And so people that derive their net worth from their stock portfolio uh, get wealthy by the Federal Reserve diluting the currency supply, stealing wealth from the average person, put it, uh, taking that dilution and putting the excess wealth that's taken from the uh, middle class and it goes into the stock market and makes Bill Gates uh, twice as rich as he was before they started all this process. Uh, and then... Um, when somebody that derives their net worth from their stock portfolio, when they sell a little bit of those stocks uh, and then they spend it in the general economy, they're getting a whole lot more dollars for their stock 
and then they get to spend that stock, that those dollars into the economy, and that increases the uh, the currency supply in the general economy and causes prices to rise because it's causing the dollar to go down. It has less value when they dilute the currency supply, and so this whole process of uh, QE and everything has done this giant wealth transfer, uh, and it's skewed and tipped the scales of the economy way out of balance. And uh, whenever they're out of balance, the correction, uh, the, the further out of balance they get, uh, the more violent the correction is. And so we, we are, the, the correction has started. You can see it here in bonds and the stock market. Uh, is down from where it was at the end of 2021. Why? This was the trigger, and when they first started doing this, I covered this and made these charts that the Fed, effective Fed funds rate, this is the percent change from a year earlier, and it's the greatest rate of change in history. Nothing like this had ever been done before, and you've got to realize that all of the debt that's out there, the uh, the uh, U.S. Treasuries are the backbone of the and mortgages. They're, these are the backbone of the financial system. The, it's the monetary system that the banks use. Imagine the banks having a brick wall inside and there's the monetary system we use and then there's the monetary system that they use. All of the bank reserves and uh, treasuries and mortgages and mortgage-backed securities and the bank reserves only exist in accounts at the Federal Reserve that the banks have. And they pay each other and settle accounts in these bank reserves. Uh, and uh, the, the bonds, though, and the mortgage-backed securities, when you change rates at this rate, a mortgage-backed security that was done with a th uh, three-year, th uh, I mean, with a 3% 30-year fixed uh, is not as valuable as a brand new mortgage at 7.5%. That's a much more valuable product. And so it, it causes the existing loans, the existing assets that are on the bank's balance sheets to fall dramatically. The same thing with the treasuries. Uh, a 30-year treasury that was issued back when uh, rates were, were very, very low uh, is not worth what a brand new treasury is today uh, at the rates that uh, currently exist. And so the assets that are on the bank's balance sheet change very rapidly. So where were we in 2008? We were right there. You can see that this rate of change, nothing happened like this throughout all of the QEs and everything. So this is the trigger that is, is uh, currently causing the uh, collapse of the bond market. And uh, the stock market is going down, and real estate kept on soaring. So we have these three legs of the economy, uh, and one is growing longer while the other two are getting shorter, causing a very unbalanced stool. Uh, so how did the, the crisis of 2008 play out? I've, I've presented this before, but I want to present it again just as a reminder, and I changed the format just a little bit. So in April of 2007, New Century Financial went bankrupt. And so this was a, a, a fairly large event that uh, people went, wow, that's unusual. And then nothing happened, so nobody was worried. Five months later, there were bank runs at England's Northern Rock Bank. And, and people go, wow, that hasn't happened since the Great Depression. That's unusual. But then everything got better. And six months later, Bear Stearns collapses. So you've got five months and six months pauses in here. You know, we had in March and April, we had the what I believe is just the first leg down, the first uh, uh, wave in the crisis that we are about to go in. And I think 2024, if they can keep everything from falling apart in 2024, then it's 2025 that all hell breaks loose. And, uh, and you're going to see, I mean, this is going to be the greatest financial event in history. It's going to make this pale by comparison. So you've got five months, then six months, then four months. IndyMac and Countrywide Financial collapse, and that really starts triggering things. Then two months later, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are nationalized. Once they nationalize them, all the mortgage-backed securities that they held are now fully guaranteed by the U.S. government, and the Federal Reserve 
can buy them, and this was part of Ben Bernanke's plan going back to his 2002 speech, Deflation, making sure it doesn't happen here, where he laid out the roadmap of everything he would do once the Fed reaches the zero bound. He said, we're not out of ammunition. There's a whole bunch of stuff we can do. And one of them was expanding the menu of assets, <laughs> the menu of assets that the Federal Reserve can buy. And, uh, and mortgage-backed securities became a new item on the menu. Uh, but one week after that, Lehman Brothers, the largest bankruptcy in history. Lehman Brothers was not a bank. This is a brokerage house. So it doesn't show up on any of these charts of bank failures. So, that is, so you've got five months, six months, four months, two months, one week. One day later, AIG was bailed out. Now that's an insurance company. It's not a brokerage house. It's not a bank, but it was a systemically important insurance company, and had it failed, the entire global financial system would have frozen up. So it was bailed out. Who pays for these bailouts? You do. Any taxpayer pays for, pays for these bailouts, and anybody that gets to experience inflation later. So all of us. It isn't the government. It isn't the Federal Reserve. All they can do is steal wealth from all of us and then give it to these organizations. Nine days after that, Washington Mutual, this was the largest bank failure in history. One month after that, the Fed's Troubled Assets Relief Program. Uh, one month after that, Citigroup gets bailed out. One month after that, General Motors and Chrysler get bailed out. And one month after that, Bank of America. Now remember, Bank of America, because they've been, they got bailed out in 2008 to the tune of $20 billion. And you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, these are, this is the bank bailouts, but this chart was done before uh, First Republic Bank. And um, so what you see here, the very center of each circle is on this timeline up here. And so these are the first uh, uh, bank failures. And then you have IndyMac and Countrywide here. And so that's much earlier than uh, Washington Mutual, and then all of the rest of the bank failures. And then the crisis of 2008, the global financial crisis of 2008, finally peters out in 2012. And, you know, there's a few more, uh, but, you know, we've only had, this happened March and April of 2023. Signature, Silvergate, Silicon Valley, uh, uh, First Republic, and then uh, Credit Suisse, which if that had, had been allowed to fail, you know, what happens is a systemically important bank, a globally systemically important bank, uh, if they're going to fail, they arrange a shotgun wedding between it and another bank. And so UBS absorbed uh, Credit Suisse. If it had been on this chart, the circle most likely would have more than filled the chart from top to bottom. Uh, this was huge, and basically it, it did fail, but then was merged uh, before they were actually closed and went into liquidation. Uh, so uh, I'm, you know, I'm just pretty darn certain for myself on my, uh, but see, that is an opinion, but it's an opinion that is based on a whole lot of data. I like to look at the data and then create my opinions working backwards from whatever the facts are instead of having an opinion and then trying to prove that opinion. Um, so uh, let's take a look at where we were in 2008 as far as the bank's financial conditions. Now in 2008, there, were a, there was a lot of exposure to the real estate crisis and that's what caused all of the bank failures. But 2008 is right there. And uh, this is the unrealized losses on the bank's balance sheets. Uh, so if, and you've got two classes of unrealized losses. There's all the uh, bonds and notes, the usually longer term bonds and notes. Bills are the short term treasuries uh, that are held to maturity. And that's the red area. And the ones that are available for sale are marked to market. But when you are holding it to maturity, you can hold those on your balance sheet at face value. Well, what they've done here is calculate the losses if they really disclosed what the, if they marked all of those uh, held to maturity uh, bonds and notes to, uh, 
to market, you would see these enormous losses. Look at where we were in 2008 before the global financial crisis started and the world monetary system almost froze compared to today, and the crash hasn't even started yet. The banks are in some serious trouble, actually. Now, the last two bars in that gray zone are estimates that uh, the Financial Times here, and the source is the FDIC, uh, but they've added these estimates. But uh, the last time I showed this chart, which was during the uh, financial crisis of uh, 2023 in March or April, I showed this chart, and it only had uh, the um, first, we now have bars up to the third quarter of 2023 that are real on this chart. And uh, we only had to the end of 22, I think, uh, when I first showed this chart. So this is updated. Um, and it shows <laughs> that we are teetering on a knife's edge. We are in a dangerous spot in history. Uh, this is the four biggest banks' net unrealized losses. The red one is Bank of America, which got bailed out in 2008. And this is sort of scary for me. It's one of uh, the banks that I, you know, I, I bank with a number of banks, and Bank of America is one of them that I use. Uh, I might go for a little bit less exposure after seeing this, uh, this graph, but um, this is pretty scary, and it goes up to the third quarter of 2023, so it's pretty recent data. Uh, so where were we in 2008? 2008 isn't even on this graph. Um, have we passed the point of no return? Well, the point of the point of no return is the return or lack thereof. This is a chart from my book uh, that is one of the most important charts that there is. And basically, if the, if, we, if the country goes a dollar deeper in debt, if the Treasury borrows a dollar and it gets spent into the economy, what is the return? And for every dollar that we went in debt back after World War II, we would get between six and eight dollars of growth in GDP. Now, a lot of this has to do with the demographics that were involved and were coming out of the Great Depression, so growth was much easier. Uh, but as we built up more and more debt, and there's interest due on that debt, there's less and less return. Uh, what happened in right there, that's the 2008 global financial crisis and all of the, uh, uh, the QE, one, two, three, uh, and we are now at a point, and we haven't been able to get back to the point where we can borrow a dollar and grow the economy quicker than we are going in debt. So um, right now, the politicians are able to spend more currency uh, than our income, and the return for that expenditure is not a return that makes up for it. We, the, the old rules from before 2008 no longer apply, and the problem is no politicians know this. And we're trying, their, their remedies are to try to borrow our way to prosperity, to, to uh, do deficit spending and spend our way out of debt. And it's not working. It's not working since 2008. The old rules no longer apply. All they can do is dig the pit deeper and deeper and deeper. So ever since 2008, for every dollar that we borrow and go deeper in debt, we only get 30 to 50 cents worth of GDP growth. This is a death spiral. And as the uh, interest on the national debt grows, and it is taking off like a rocket, and in just the past couple of years, it's gone from about half uh, a trillion to a trillion dollars a year. So it's, it's basically doubled the, uh, the interest on the national debt. And we aren't anywhere near, you know, uh, in the next two years, we have to refinance uh, more than half. It's 16 trillion of the, uh, the 33 trillion. So it's right about half of our national debt is going to roll over in the next couple of years, and that has to be refinanced at these very high rates. And so you're going to be seeing uh, $2 trillion a year going to interest on the national debt. So it's going to be sucking up all of the discretionary spending, but the politicians are just going to increase the deficits, and, which, and, and this is a death spiral. Uh, it, what the, the only way 
to lower long-term interest rates is for the Fed to start buying the long-term bonds. And if they start buying the long-term bonds, it means the Treasury can issue more at low rates. But when the Fed buys all of these uh, bonds and stuff, it scares bond investors, and the bond investors demand a higher rate of interest for the risk they're taking. What is the risk of loaning your currency to the government for 30 years? Uh, that is the interest rate that they're asking for compensation for that amount of risk. And the more they see uh, the national debt being monetized by the Fed and the currency supply being diluted, the, more, the higher the interest rate they're going to want. So the only buyer left is then, the, if they want to keep the interest rates low, the only buyer left is the Federal Reserve. No private investor is going to be crazy enough to loan their currency to the government for that period of time. And so this begins a death spiral. This, that coupled with this chart of a negative return uh, for each dollar we go deeper in debt. And so it's this death spiral that goes down and it'll be speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. And so uh, the point of no return, like I said, is the return or lack thereof. And so uh, this three-legged stool of uh, stocks, real estate, and bonds, debt, uh, is we've got uh, two of those legs are currently starting to disintegrate and they're getting shorter, while the other leg is being extended by growing the debt, the growing the size of the bond market. The bond market is the largest market in the world, the debt markets. And uh, 33 trillion of it is uh, our national debt. And that is going to be growing at this exponential rate, but it's not growing out of this like uh, old uh, hard oak. They're using like balsa wood that has cracks in it already and extending it as quickly as possible. So you've got this really weak uh, leg that's getting longer and longer and longer while the other two are getting shorter. And then you pile on the weight of wars and deficit spending and a crisis where they're going to do all of these bailouts and who eventually pays, no matter whether they're creating currency to do it or using your currency in your deposits as a bail-in, which was, you know, that was passed. So this is legal to do in the United States. The banks will be able to do, to take a percentage of your deposits and give that to these failing, uh, and it creates this moral hazard where you get these, uh, cor these corporations, these uh, giant entities through a crisis where they, you know, they would have collapsed and you make it so that they know that, well, the government's going to bail us out every time this happens. And it just increases what Alan Greenspan labeled moral hazard. And so they become more reckless. And the next time around, it's just worse. And we are about to experience the next time around. Remember, the first time it was just one leg of this stool, the year 2000, it was stocks. And then in the same decade, we had real estate and stocks, two legs had a problem. And then this time around, the bubbles, the, the uh, legs have gotten longer, they've gotten unstable, and they've got cracks in them, and two of the legs are already starting to crumble and disintegrate. And, and so uh, we've got bubbles in all three legs, two of them, stocks and bonds, are starting to crumble and disintegrate. And going back to that deja vu of the 2005, 6, and 7, talking to investors, real estate investors, and showing them data that this is in a bubble and it's going to end badly. Oh, no, no, no. I'm in this sector of real estate, or there's this supply shortage. And like I said, if you can't afford it, it doesn't matter if there's a supply shortage, the bubble will still burst. And so <laughs> I'm sorry to leave you with such, you know, and I'm laughing here because I'm going to close this with happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, all I want to do is I want to remind everybody that in every crisis there is an opportunity. And I believe the biggest crisis in history is coming straight at us. It, it, I think either 2024, 2024 should really be 
a historic year of uh, everything like falling apart and the, the biggest, it's gonna make the 2008 global financial crisis look like a flea on a dog's butt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's, it's going to be big, but there is an opportunity in there for those who can find it. So again, happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Hey guys, just want to let you know that we'll be running a Black Friday deal at goldsilver.com. If you want to turn some of your currency into real money, you'll get fantastic deals like 20%, 30% or even 55% off premiums on the products you already love. So go to goldsilver.com now.